So I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to be here and uh, to be able to talk about my research. As Laura mentioned, I've been uh, working for quite a while now. It's actually close to 20 years in Central Asia and Siberia. Um, I started my PhD working on Central Asian Neanderthals, um, which at the time was a very, very, very small, very small um, uh, amount of fossils. Um, but since then, it became very exciting. Um, lots of new discoveries and uh, both the development of new methods and, and new finds have allowed us to, to really get a, a very different picture than what we had before. So let me start out first, of course, with the Neanderthals. The Neanderthals are our closest fossil relatives. Um, and they are actually quite well known for a fossil, uh, for a fossil human taxon. We have skeletal remains from, from hundreds of individuals, most of them, of course, very, very small fragments, but we have several relatively complete skeletons from, from babies to, you know, grandpas more or less. Um, so we have a relatively good understanding of their morphology. Um, we also have genetic evidence about which I will talk a bit more later. And of course, we also have lots and lots of archaeological evidence. So we understand their culture and behavior better than for, than for most other uh, extinct human taxa. Um, what I find fascinating about Neanderthals is how our view of them changed over time. And, and that's, for example, can be very well seen in, in how reconstructions change over time. Um, I think our view of them today is much more nuanced than before. And I think most of us uh, understand um, how their, their humanity, how similar they were to us. But of course, you know, there are, uh, there are some differences. What is interesting about Neanderthals is that they were actually geographically relatively widespread, and this was something we didn't understand in the beginning. If you go back about, you know, 100 years or even 50 years, the idea was that Neanderthals are primarily a European taxon with, you know, a few outliers in maybe in the Near East, and, uh, and there was a single uh, fossil known from Uzbekistan from the site of Teshik Tash, um, but they were mostly seen as a, as a taxon that was adapted uh, and, and primarily present in Europe. Um, today, we understand that actually their geographic range covered um, large parts of, uh, of the uh, Asian uh, steppe belt as well, likely, even though we have relatively few finds, but it seems pretty clear that they, that they moved around uh, there also. Um, I'll be focusing on, on Central Asia in the wider sense, which includes the various Central Asian republics of the former Soviet Union, um, would also include things like Afghanistan and Southern Siberia. Um, in this region, we actually have quite a few fossil remains. Um, um, some of the more Eastern Neanderthals in the Caucasus and in, in uh, Iraq and Iran, um, but then also the finds from Teshik Tash in Uzbekistan, from Ubir Ahmad also in Uzbekistan. Selungur in Kyrgyzstan, a site that I've been working on the last five years, um, said that we don't have any new human remains. Um, I'm not going to talk about it uh, uh, because of that mostly. Um, and then the area that probably is the, is the most interesting one, the area of the Altai Mountains uh, on the border between Kazakhstan, Russia, China, and Mongolia. Um, what is interesting about this region is that it's actually um, quite um, quite diverse ecologically it includes uh rather i would say rather extreme environments which which makes it interesting because um these hominins had to adapt to these very very different and very extreme environments um so this is roughly the region that i'm that i'm talking about um which includes some of the most extreme deserts in the world um the gobi and the taklamakan um but it also includes some of the highest mountain chains in the world, parts of the Himalaya, such as the, the Pamir. Um, there are also more, um, I'd say, medium uh, mountain ranges, the Altai Sayan chain, which we'll be uh, visiting, um, but also very, um, uh, very large um, um, uh, open environments, such as the steppes that in the end run from Eastern Europe, from Hungary, um, into, into Mongolia and China. And, and the steppes are, for me, one of the most uh, fascinating ones, because I, I feel that they likely served kind of as a highway for east-west migrations. Um, once you were ad 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 adapted to this open environment, um, you could move, uh, move across relatively easily. The problem is that we have extremely limited archaeological evidence from this area. Um, due to um, relatively, you know, sparse habitation, um, uh, both in the past and, and today, 
uh, and so very few, uh, very few excavations. Um, but it seems that there was quite a bit of movement. There's other complications too. Parts of the steppes in in um, in southern Siberia, for example, likely turned into swamps over large parts of the of the. Um, uh, late Pleistocene with uh, large lakes and so on, and and that would have both been uh, hard to hard to traverse, um, and also of course strongly limits what kind of archaeological evidence we have. Um, to the north, the area is bordered by the uh, by the boreal forests of uh, of uh, Siberia, again an area where we we don't have any kind of fossil and archaeological records, sadly. Um, but you know it's possible that some hominins also extended a little bit further north there there are some very tantalizing um lithics for example from northern siberia from yakusha um which are claimed to date back to to more than a hundred thousand years i'm skeptical a little bit but i i know geologists who work there and and they are quite they are quite convinced that you have um pois 5e human habitation up there and this is an area where you know it's routinely below minus 50 in the winter these days so it's uh, it's really an extreme environment um the interest in Central Asia from the perspective of human evolution is not completely new. Actually, the first archaeologist to uh, or paleontologist to work there was Roy Chapman Andrews, who was a paleontologist at the American Museum of Natural History. And he's a very interesting character. He's supposed to be the role model on whom um, the character of Indiana Jones was uh, was modeled. Um, he had this thought that Central Asia might be the cradle of cradle of mankind. And so he organized these gigantic expeditions with hundreds of camels that carried gas for his two cars um, into Inner Mongolia, so the, the uh, north, uh, northwest of China. Um, he did not find any human fossils, but he was the first one to discover the immensely rich paleontological sites in the Gobi with dinosaurs and early mammals and everything. Um, so in the end, you know, he was uh, rather, uh, rather successful. Um, Really, paleoanthropological research in Central Asia uh, started with the work of uh, Okladnikov, uh, uh, Alexander uh, Okladnikov, who was a, a Russian archaeologist, and he's really the father of Central Asian and Siberian archaeology. From the 1930s till the 1980s, um, every year he worked in in uh, in this area, and he was among the first. He was the first to find a Neanderthal um, at Tashiktash. Um, but he was also the first to excavate sites such as Sianungur that I mentioned in Kyrgyzstan and also the sites in the Altai. He, he had several sites in the Altai with very early stone tools that he thought were um, Middle Paleolithic or even, even earlier. Um, I'm going to take you, though, to one specific place today. Um, we'll start off in, uh, in the Nisava Cave. As you can see, we're, we're zooming in here into, into the mountains of the, of the Altai. Um, now, what you have to keep in mind, despite this being Siberia, the, the popular vision of Siberia as kind of an, an Arctic wasteland is, is very wrong. Um, the Nisava Cave, for example, is roughly the same latitude as Leipzig in southern Germany. Um, I'm not sure where that would be in the UK, but I think it's it's uh, it's probably like in uh, in in the northern part of England. Um, and the environment there is 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 not at all uh, extreme. The Altai Mountains are a medium mountain range uh, with lots of forests, um, a mixture of open environments. It's very continental, of course, um, um, very warm uh, summers and and cold winters, and it seems to also be the case in in most of the of the late Pleistocene anyway. Um, you have a diverse fauna uh, then, lots of horses, bisons, um, several kinds of antelopes, um, uh, saigas, and then another one, spiroceras, um, um, mammoth, woolly rhino. Um, it's, a, it's a relatively rich environment, especially for, uh, for the region, and likely served as a, as a refugium. Um, the most important site is, of course, uh, the Nisava Cave. Uh, this is a view, actually, I'm standing more or less on top of the cave. You see at the bottom, you see the scientific camp that, are, that my Russian colleagues built over the last, um, it's close to 40 years now. They started working in the Nisava in 1981. Um, it was discovered by Ovadov, a paleontologist who was looking for cave bear bones, and while digging around, he first found a uh, metal age material. There's also a rich Scythian occupation uh, horizon in the cave with uh, numerous burials. Um, but then he also found some, some lithics and more extensive excavation started uh, then. Um, this is the entrance of the cave. 
Um, you see here um, in kind of in the center, the entrance into the so-called main chamber. And then there's also a, a, a side entrance to the what is what is usually called the South Gallery, um, a smaller area. The cave is about uh, 20 meters above the Anui River, overlooking this river valley, and was likely a you know a useful uh, stop uh, while while moving through these valleys, and also allowed you to uh, to see uh, fauna uh, coming through from relatively far away. Um, one of the problems in general in caves, but especially in Denisova, is that the stratigraphy is very complex um, and has been influenced by many post-depositional factors. There's um, uh, water activity in the cave, there is actually a chimney on top from where water was uh, was coming in. And there's also um, a lot of activity by hyenas who were digging around in the cave and making a complete mess. Um, not only, you know, destroying bones, but also just uh, mixing up the stratigraphy. And so we are still, we have a bit of a problem. For many of the hominin fossils, it's hard to tell exactly how old they are. Um, there's a large number of, uh, of um, absolute dates uh, from Denisova. Um, both um, OSL and uh, for the for the lower part and C14. It seems as if the human habitation in the cave started close to 300,000 years ago. Um, based on the OSL dates, the problem is that the genetic data um, seems to indicate quite a bit quite a bit younger fossils. So it's it's uh, it's a bit conflicting. Um, the what is also interesting is that you seem to have, uh, the, the cave seems to be occupied alternating by Neanderthals and Denisovans, and then of course towards the end also by, by modern humans. And we know this both because we have Neanderthal and Denisovan fossils that are, that are intercalated, um, but also by studies of sediment DNA. Um, a new method that, that started uh, uh, about five years ago, um, it became possible to extract um, human DNA directly from the, from the dirt in the cave. Uh, likely the people used you know, the back of the cave as a toilet and so left traces of their DNA there. And we can use that DNA to assess which population was uh, present in, in, uh, in which horizon. So here, for example, um, 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 red, uh, red numbers or red uh, DNA means uh, the presence of, of Denisovans, a group that I'll be talking about in a moment, and blue is, is the presence of Neanderthals. So quite, uh, quite fascinating. Um, Denisova is very well known for actually for for this fossil here, which is probably the least spectacular fossil in the world. Um, you see here this tiny little speck of uh, of brown bone. Um, it's actually it's it's a cast. It's not the it's not the original, but it's you know it's it's uh, it's uh, the real thing. Looks just like that on the hand of Susanna Sawyer, who worked uh, who worked with us on the on the DNA. This tiny little piece, a fragment of a finger bone of a kid, um, is what really brought Denisova to the forefront of our of our uh, attention. So already in the 1980s, they discovered uh, two teeth, Denisova one and Denisova two, of which actually one turned out to be a bison. Um, very disappointingly. Uh, later on, it's an it's a it's a very worn incisor, uh, just a crown. The root is broken off, and um, it was described as a Neanderthal originally, and then it turned out that it was a bison. Um, Denisova two is a, is a very broken deciduous molar. So this was among the first fossils from the cave, and it looked like nothing. Um, it's really you can see here these are micro CT based renderings. Um, it's the proximal articular surface of a distal phalanx with a tiny bit of the of the shaft still adhering. Um, it was a juvenile individual. The uh, epiphyses were just uh, uh, in course of uh, of fusing. Um, in reality, they they actually found the whole uh, finger bone, and there's a there's a long story about how the the, the specimen was photographed. Um, but sadly, those photos were lost. And then after taking pictures, it was cut in two and part of it went to Leipzig to the Max Planck Institute for Ancient DNA Analysis. And the other half went to another institution um, where they actually uh, over time destroyed it completely to get DNA and, and didn't get any real DNA out of it, which is, which is a shame. Um, and we don't have CT scans of the other half, just a few um, bad pictures. Um, but this is not the not the only fossil evidence we have from this cave. We also have a few teeth, and and these are these are interesting for me. I like uh, I like I like fossil teeth. This one is probably the, and I'm I'm biased, but it's for me it's the most beautiful tooth in the in the fossil record. Um, it's this it's this enormous molar, um, uh, Denisova four. 
Um, and as you can see, the, the crown is relatively complex. I, I didn't put in any, uh, any um, uh, plots of, of the size here. Uh, but I can I can tell you it's larger than than any Neanderthal molar. It's larger than than practically all Homo erectus molars. It's larger than 99.999% of recent modern molars. It's an it's a freaking enormous uh, enormous tooth. Um, it's it's actually so big when I first showed it um, or a cast of it to to a colleague. He was like, "This is not human. This is a cave bear." Um, and no, it's it, it it did turn out to be um, to be human. It also have these massive um, has these massive flared roots, which you know likely indicate that it it was anchored in a relatively large um, jaw. But of course, it's uh, it's hard to tell how how the cranium looked from this from this tooth. So the fossil evidence we have from Denisova is relatively fragmentary. But luckily these days, you know, we're not just limited by by um, the morphology um, or or by, to the information we can get uh, get from the morphology. We can also have um, uh, DNA from here, and so I, you know, I want to talk a little bit about our uh, how uh, we analyze um, ancient DNA. Um, ancient DNA studies is simply studying the DNA, the genetic information that is preserved in fossils. Um, we know since the 1980s that actually DNA can be preserved over a relatively long time spans. In the 1980s, they were looking at DNA that was a few hundred to a few thousand years old. The oldest uh, stuff at the time was um, from Egyptian mummies. Uh, and then in the early 90s, there was a bit of a crazy scramble and everyone tried to do dinosaur DNA and, and DNA from plants that were millions of years old. And we know today that all that they found that there was all contamination. But actually, by the late 90s, methods were developed that allowed us um, to slowly access uh, DNA um, that was, you know, thousands or maybe even tens of thousands of years old. Um, to, you know, show it to you very, uh, in a very simplified way, ancient DNA, DNA analyses are destructive, which is definitely a limitation. You have to destroy some of the fossil, um, some of the bone to get, to get the DNA, which, you know, is, uh, limits it a bit um, because you don't want to... Uh, do too much, uh, too much damage. In the beginning, it was a lot. So this is a picture of the uh, of the humerus of Neanderthal one of the whole type of of Neanderthals from the Feldhofer cave near Dusseldorf um, that they sampled. And as you can see, they cut out a significant piece um, and then also drilled into it. Today, we can work with much, much smaller samples. Um, we usually use about 20 to 30 milligrams. So compared to, I think it's five, five to seven grams that they used here, so much, much less. What you do is you, you uh, make some bone powder, then you use various chemicals that break down the proteins in there and really select, uh, selectively uh, take out the DNA. And then you use various methods to amplify the DNA to, to make many, many copies of it, and then sequence it, read out the, 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 the letters um, uh, of which the DNA consists. Now, of course, you know, this is extremely, extremely simplified in reality. This takes, uh, this takes quite a while, a lot of expertise and, uh, and experience, especially if you want to avoid contamination. Um, our, our biggest enemy in, in, uh, in ancient DNA is really contamination, uh, DNA getting in that, that was not there in the original specimen. Um, what really limits this is problems with uh, DNA preservation. If you look at recent uh, at recent tissue, for example, if you take a gram of, of human bone, you have about one microgram of DNA in there. Um, and then, you know, always when you work with DNA um, in the lab, you try to work as cleanly as possible. Um, you always get in a little bit of contamination. But when you work with recent material, if you work well, um, the contamination is very little compared to the actual DNA from the specimen. So you're uh, you're OK. Um, this is a bit harder when you work with ancient DNA. Because the first problem you run into is that there's much, much less DNA there. Um, you have, in many cases, by more than a factor of a million fold less DNA than, than in recent tissue. Um, and then the other problem is that the DNA, DNA, instead of coming in long strands, as in, as in recent tissue, breaks up into tiny little pieces. You have to imagine you have a book and you put it through a shredder. Um, and then you actually you take several, many copies of this book, you put it all through the shredder, throw away most of it, and then try to reconstruct the book from these tiny little pieces. You know, our, our genome is about 3 billion base pairs, 3 billion letters long. In ancient DNA, you usually have fragments that are maybe 50 to 100 base pairs long. So really tiny, tiny pieces only. Um, and not only are they small pieces, they're also damaged. 
um, various chemical processes over time actually affect the DNA and change certain letters. The good thing is that uh, this is actually relatively predictable. We know that this happens at the ends of the, of the fragments, and we also know which bases tend to change to which bases, just you know, for, for, for chemical reasons. And so we actually we can use this damage to tell whether the DNA we have um, in our fossil is old or, or whether it's recent contamination. And that is actually already a big, uh, big help because we can uh, selectively um, uh, remove the DNA of, for example, people who worked at the excavation. Um, or who washed the fossil or whatever else. Um, so that's uh, actually the damage is, is a bit of an advantage. Okay, something sticking here. So what you should see here also is uh, another big problem with ancient DNA is that besides the DNA of the human or animal that we want to study, there's also lots of uh, exogenous DNA. For example, as soon as you know, as, as the body starts decomposing, various kinds of fungi and bacteria move into um, into uh, into the bones and colonize it. And of course, you know these bacteria and fungi also have DNA. And so some of the DNA we find actually is not from um, is, is not from the individual that we're looking at, but from these uh, um, these other uh, things. Okay, I'm hanging here uh, at this slide and can't uh, proceed, so that's a bit of a problem. Give me a second. Oh. I'm just gonna try stopping sharing for a second. Oh, really sorry. There. Sorry. Um, so uh, the problem is not only that we have the, the issues with the uh, with the uh, bacterial and fungal DNA, which we can all remove. Like once you sequence the DNA, you know, you can just run every every fragment through a database and you can tell, you know, is this like a human or is it something else? And if it's something else, you just throw it away. Um, but also because you have much, much less DNA, any kind of contamination makes up a much bigger part. So working with the ancient DNA is pretty finicky and especially with ancient human DNA that's this old, there's only three, four left labs in the world that can actually um, that can actually do it. But the amazing thing is, you know, if you manage to extract DNA, you can um, you can find out things which would be practically impossible only using um, uh, morphology. So what we first did with the with the Denisova finger bone is we looked for mitochondrial DNA. Um, our cells include uh, two different kinds of DNA. You have the mitochondria, uh, mitochondrial DNA, which are small, um, about 17,000 base pair long uh, molecules that are included in the mitochondria, uh, in organelles in our cells. And we have hundreds and even thousands of copies per cell of the mitochondrial DNA, and then nuclear DNA, which is our, our complete genome, which is in the nucleus. So first we looked at the mitochondrial DNA because there's just much, much, much more of that present than nuclear DNA. Um, and, and because it's small, only 17,000 base pairs, it's easier to reconstruct. So when we looked at the mitochondrial DNA from uh, this Denisova finger bone, we found that if we compare it to modern humans, to Neanderthals and to chimpanzees, we found that it seems to be an outgroup to Neanderthals and modern humans. It's less related to us than to um, than Neanderthals are. Um, we thought at the time the split between Neanderthals and modern humans was about half a million years ago. And the split off of this genet of this mitochondrial DNA sequence from Denisova was quite a bit older, about a million years, maybe even a bit more. So this was the first thing that told us in Denisova cave, we have something else than Neanderthals. Um, this seems to be a, a completely different group. Now there's one problem though. Mitochondrial DNA, besides, you know, has the advantage of being very easy to easy to study. Um, it has one relatively uh, pesky uh, uh, characteristic though it is inherited only matrilinearly. So you get your mitochondrial DNA from your mom and she got it from her mom and she got it from her mom. So if you go back in time, um, you actually are only looking at a very small percentage or very, very small portion of the ancestry of this individual. Um, the other problem is, is that because it's inher inherited matrilinearly, um, for, uh, mitochondrial DNA lineages can get lost relatively easily. Um, if, for example, if a woman only has sons, um, her sons will not pass on her mitochondrial um, uh, lineage, even though she has descendants um, based on mitochondrial DNA that, that seems to disappear. 
So mitochondrial DNA is, is not ideal and can be misleading. If you actually look at nuclear DNA phylogenies... Sì, sì, sì. Perché sarebbe scalderebbe un ruscello? Sorry? I think someone unmuted by mistake there. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> I thought it was a question first. Um, yeah, so uh, so nuclear DNA uh, can give rather different results, and that was actually the case uh, with with Denisova. When we uh, um, so this is the mitochondrial DNA phylogeny again. When we looked at the nuclear DNA, which is you know harder because there's there's um, um, it's just much harder to reconstruct it, and you have less copies per cell. Um, when we looked at the uh, nuclear DNA, we found that actually based on the nuclear DNA. The, this group that we call the Denisovans, um, simply because, you know, Neanderthals come from the uh, Neander Valley. Um, and so, you know, Denisovans should come from, uh, from Denisova Cave. Um, Denisovans um, should be, um, uh, are, are actually a sister group of Neanderthals. They separated from them about, you know, 450, maybe 500,000 years ago, um, while both of these groups separated from uh, recent humans about 650,000 years ago. And honestly, these estimates of the time are all very relative. You know, they are based always on, on calibrating with the human uh, chimp separation. And depending on, on what time you assume for that, uh, these dates can move around quite a bit. What usually doesn't change, though, is the sequence of events. So it's clear that Neanderthals are closer related to Denisovans than they are to us. Um, and and I, that's not, that's not going to change. Um, so this was, this was extremely exciting. We suddenly had a group that we didn't know about uh, before that is related to Neanderthals. Um, but then, of course, we also asked the question, um, you know, these kind of phylogenies are, are, are very linear. They, they show uh, branching events. Um, but we asked ourselves, you know, was there maybe also contact? Was there maybe gene flow between these populations afterwards? And using DNA, you know, you can, you can actually look at that. I'm not going to go into the details what kind of methods we used. Um, but what we did is we took um, five modern human genomes, uh, two from Africa, a Khoisan, a Yoruba, uh, a Khoisan and a Yoruba, uh, one from Europe, um, a French genome, uh, one from East Asia, from China, and one from uh, Papua New Guinea. And if we and we compared the Neanderthal genome that we had from a Neanderthal from Croatia, um, that was published uh, before we had this uh, Denisovan uh, DNA, um, and we took the Denisovan DNA and try to see how they are related to these present day populations. And what we found is when we compare um, Neanderthal DNA to modern humans, um, some modern human populations uh, in specifically the ones outside of Africa are closer related to Neanderthals than African populations are. And the most, you know, the logical explanation for this is, is that as humans migrated out of Africa, they met Neanderthal populations that were already in, in the Near East, in, in Asia, in, in Europe, and interbred with them. And so present day populations outside of Africa all carry, you know, somewhere between one and 3% of, uh, of Neanderthal DNA. And because this is relatively uniform in, in uh, everywhere outside of uh, Africa, we think that this interbreeding likely happened relatively soon after leaving Africa. And we know today that in reality, it's much more complicated. There's been repeated interbreeding events. Um, we have, for example, a 36,000 year old individual from Europe that uh, carries much, much more Neanderthal DNA, but it seems not to be related to later European populations. It's a, it's a much more complicated story than this, but, um, but um, it was uh, um, still possible to, um, to show that there have been some contacts with Neanderthals um, after leaving Africa. Now, we also did the same analysis with, uh, with Denisovans. And what is interesting there is that we see 0% Denisovan ancestry in Africa, which is you know, not surprising. We know Denisovans from Siberia. Um, it's unlikely that they were in contact with populations in, in, in Africa. Uh, we also see 0% in Europe. Um, when we looked in, in East Asia, we found about 0.1%, which you know, seems very low compared to the, the amount of Neanderthal um, DNA, but you know, it's better than nothing. Um, the big surprise came when we were looking at populations in Melanesia. Um, actually, the first individual we were looking at for this was from um, um, 
was from New Britain, so just off Papua New Guinea. Um, and we realized that these populations in Melanesia, so Papuans uh, and, and Australian Aborigines, carry about four to six percent of the Nisman DNA on top of their uh, on top of the Neanderthal DNA that they already carry. Um, and for me, this was especially surprising because the distance between um, Denisova Cave and Papua New Guinea is close to 10,000 kilometers. And, you know, the idea that that the ancestors of Papuans migrated through Siberia seemed a little, little far fetched. Um, and we'll get to this in in a little while. Um, we think actually that the Nice events were likely relatively widespread. We think that they were present in in large parts of Asia. Um, and, you know, we've been working on the last 10 years on trying to identify some fossils that might uh, uh, that might be the nice events. I think there are some in in China. Um, Southeast Asia is is much harder. And and I I do expect that at some point we'll find something. But up until now, it hasn't been very successful. Um, Using these methods to detect gene flow actually uh, showed that that our ancestry is much more complicated than we thought uh, previously. Um, we have, uh, um, uh, it seems that every time that these groups, Neanderthals, Denisovans, um, uh, modern humans, every time they met, they exchanged genes. Clearly, they recognized each other as, as uh, potential mating partners. One interesting event is also that we see in Denisovans, we saw uh, we see genetic evidence of gene flow from something we call the potentially unknown hominin, which in my opinion is most likely is uh, is uh, East uh, or Asian Homo erectus. Um, there seems to be like small pieces of DNA in the in the Denisovan genome that have a very, very old um, coalescence date. So they split from from our DNA a very long time ago, one, one and a half million years ago. And that, in my opinion, would fit with an early migration of Homo erectus uh, into Asia and then the Denisovans meeting them uh, there. Um, sadly, without a, a Homo erectus genome, it's going to be very hard uh, to prove this. And we'll come back to this um, 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 in, in the future. So I talked about the Denisovans. Um, of course, there's also Neanderthals in the Altai, which which is interesting. Um, because really, roughly at the same time that we have Denisovans in Denisova Cave, 100 kilometers away at a site called Chagirskaya Cave, closer to the border with uh, Kazakhstan, so it's it's a little bit um, uh, southwest of Denisova, um, we have a, a, a couple of occupational horizons um, that are extremely rich and that were produced by Neanderthals. And this is what is, you know, for me as a paleoanthropologist, what is amazing about this site is that we actually have um, good fossils and lots of them. So we're at the moment at about 80 fragments of uh, of Neanderthals, a bunch of teeth, um, post crania. We have even good parts or or parts of an uh, of an arm, um, good parts of a foot, um, and there's several other like ribs and vertebrae that are that are not in this picture. Um, and what is interesting too is that. Um, all of this is associated with a very rich uh, uh, archaeological assemblage as well. So Denisova actually, despite you know the site being very well known, um, has not been occupied very intensively. It's not comparable to sites in southwest France where you know you have um, um, bone upon bone and, uh, and lithic upon lithic. Um, there's Per, per cubic meter of sediment in Denisova Cave, there's only a you know maybe a dozen lithics or so. Um, it's it's really it's it's not it, it it looks like the occupation is very ephemeral. Groups come through, stop there maybe as a you know as a as a as an overnight stop while while out hunting and then they then they move on. Um, Chagirska Cave on the other side seems to be uh, very densely settled. The occupation is very short. We think maybe a, a couple of hundred years uh, at most, um, you know, not continuously, but over a couple of hundred years. Um, and and we have uh, hundreds of thousands of lithics. We have hundreds of thousands of animal bones, um, lots of evidence for butchery, very little evidence for carnivore presence. Well, in the Nisova cave, uh, most of the bones, including the human bones, actually were probably brought in by carnivores. And again, I, I don't have time to talk about the taphonomy, but um, there's lots and lots of hyena and cave lion and, and cave bear in, in Denisova. And many of the human bones have actually been digested. You see evidence of acid etching on them. I'll, I'll show one later. 
Um, Integers kind of cave that doesn't seem to be the case. And we're even thinking that maybe there might have been a, a, a burial because uh, this arm uh, seems to be relatively uh, uh, well together and would make sense that this was a burial that uh, got destroyed later on by postpositional movement in the cave. Um, what is also nice in Integers is that we see some very uh, clear Neanderthal traits in, in, in these individuals. We have this mandible, for example, that has an obliquely uh, slanting mylohyoid line. Uh, the teeth show the characteristics you want to see in Neanderthals with mid-trigonid crests. We have nice shovel-shaped incisors. It's just really very um, uh, characteristic Neanderthals. So we have um, more or less at the same time Neanderthals in Trigirska and 100 kilometers away in, in Denisova cave, uh, we have at the same time Denisovans. Now, what is remarkable is that in Denisova cave, we also have Neanderthals, but these Neanderthals were quite a bit before. So Trigirskaya and most of the Denisovan occupation in, in, in Denisova dates to maybe 50 to 80,000 years ago. There are older horizons in Denisova though as well, dating back to 120, 140,000 years ago. And what is fascinating is that these earlier occupations there were likely Neanderthals. And the best example for that is this here, Denisova 5, which is a, which is a toe bone. Again, you know, not a, nothing uh, spectacular, but, but you know, a decent toe bone. And based on its mitochondrial DNA, this individual uh, was clearly a Neanderthal. Uh, it plotted with Neanderthals from, uh, from Europe. Um, and so what was amazing about this Neanderthal is that it had really, really well-preserved DNA. And so we actually could look at its genome um, at a much higher, in, in, in much more detail than, uh, than with most uh, other Neanderthals that we had DNA for. Um, because, you know, our genome in the end samples two individuals. You know, each of the chromosomes we inherit, one of them we get from our mom, the other one from our dad. Um, and so actually, if we have a high enough quality genome, we can look at the portions of the DNA that came from, from our mom and the portions that came from our dad, and we can see how closely related they were. And this is very useful for understanding how diverse the population was, for example, that they, uh, that they came from. And what was fascinating in the case of this Neanderthal from Denisova Cave, which on this plot is labeled uh, Altai, this is a bit of a weird plot. Um, you have to imagine you're going along a chromosome here to, uh, on the on the x-axis and on the y-axis you always get spikes when uh, you have high heterozygosity. So that means that that uh, positions where the chromosome you got from your mom and from your dad are are very different. And what you can see here is that there's large stretches in the genome of this Neanderthal where the mom and the dad were absolutely identical genetically, which means that we were very closely related. Um, and already you see this in Denisova, which is the Denisova finger bone in the middle. Um, it's also less diverse than what you see, for example, in, in present day populations. So this seems to indicate that you had uh, these, these, these individuals came from populations that were genetically not very diverse. And you can drill down in a bit more detail in this, and we could actually um, figure out that these Neanderthal from Denisova cave had parents that are so closely related that they actually had to be either um, double first cousins. So they actually, they shared all their, uh, they shared their grandparents. They had to be grandfather and granddaughter, half siblings or, or uncle and niece. I mean, this is, you know, this is like European royalty style inbreeding um, that's been going on here, indicating that this was likely a very small population. Um, now, what was fascinating is that um, you can actually use complicated statistics to remove the effect of this very recent inbreeding uh, of the parents um, and look at the, at the genetic diversity uh, before that. And what we found is that even if you remove the effect of this very recent inbreeding, um, these Neanderthal came from a very, very small population, maybe 20, 30 individuals um, continuously for, for many generations. Um, which is which is extremely unusual and you don't find in any kind of uh, of present day population. You can then use other methods to actually reconstruct the size of the the so called effective population size, which is a measure of genetic diversity, but is also linked to how large the population is from which this individual came um, over time. 
And so this is a so-called uh, partial sequential Markovian coalescent plot, which is a, you know, it's, it's a complicated stat a statistical method um, that more or less chops up the genome into little pieces. And then for each of these pieces um, looks when the last common ancestor of these various individuals that you're comparing here uh, looked. And using that, you can kind of reconstruct the change in population size over time. So if you look at these colorful, um, um, uh, the blue and and uh, yellow and green lines here, roughly in the in the center of the image, you see that they are quite high up. So on the on the x axis, you have time with uh, old on the right. Uh, so as you go to the right, you go back in time, and on the y axis, you have this effective population size. And as you can see. Um, population size uh, first goes down starting about 10 million years ago and then starts increasing again, peaks about somewhere 200,000 years ago, and then drops off pretty, uh, pretty strongly. And we think that this strong drop is the out of Africa uh, event, the out of Africa bottleneck when, when the ancestors of modern humans or, or of, of, of uh, modern humans outside of Africa left Africa. And then you can see that um, over the last uh, 10,000 years or so, you have again an increase in genetic diversity, and the strongest of this is uh, is in East Asia, in in the Han, um, of course. Um, what is fascinating, you can then also use Neanderthals and Denisovans in this plot, and as you can see, they they go through more or less the same thing as we did till about a million to 500,000 years ago. Then you have a drop, which is their out of Africa bottleneck when they left Africa but they never increased again in population size. They stayed at these low levels um, for a long time, um, uh, especially uh, Neanderthals were at relatively um, uh, low levels. To figure out whether this really is a universal thing in Neanderthals, we were actually very lucky because Chagirskaya cave also gave us some DNA. And so last year we published uh, the genome of this finger bone from, uh, from Chagirskaya cave, Chagirskaya 8. As you can see, it's a beautiful terminal phalanx. Again, very, very Neanderthal style. Um, it has this large uh, mushroom shaped apical tuft. It's very wide. It's really like morphologically clearly a Neanderthal. Luckily, the, the DNA supported this. I would have been very, very upset if it would have turned out to be something else as well. Um, so what was interesting for us is that it turned out that actually this Neanderthal from Chigirskaya cave is closer related to European Neanderthals than it is to the Neanderthal from Denisova. And that is likely in part due to time. The Denisova Neanderthal is maybe 50,000 years older, about 120, 130,000 years old. This one is 50 to 60,000 years old. Um, so not only did Neanderthals um, move into the Altai, they seem to have actually migrated there twice. You seem to have two independent uh, Neanderthal migrations into uh, into this area, and we actually we showed this already before based on the on the lithics. Um, the lithic industry in Chigirskaya cave is very similar to the Mikokian you find in northern Europe, in Poland, in Germany, but also in in uh, Crimea. Um, and so we think that this this is likely a Mikokian group that moved uh, that moved east, while the the archaeological material that's earlier at Denisova is 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 very different. And so um, you know this this fits with the archaeological evidence as well. But what was fascinating is that Trigirskaya cave, we also found this very low genetic variability. This individual does not have the the extremely low, um, uh, I mean, the, the extreme recent inbreeding, its parents are not as closely related as the ones at Denisova. But if you look at at, uh, at uh, various por uh, portions of its genome, um, it seems to, again, to indicate um, very low population sizes. And these low population sizes are, are a serious problem. Um, they likely, uh, I think at least, could have played a role in, in Neanderthal extinction as well. Um, when you have these very low uh, genetic variabilities, very small populations, any kind of, you know, either just bad, bad events, um, 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 a winter that was especially cold, uh, a, an extremely dry summer when you have suddenly less, uh, less animals, or, you know, a, a herd that you rely on doesn't show up, um, could lead to the death of, you know, four or five individuals, which if you're in a group of 20, 30 um, uh, people might, might be, uh, in the end, the the final strike for your group. 
Um, so what is fascinating is that Neanderthals, uh, at least based on this genetic data, do not seem to have had any kind of mechanisms for, for replenishing their genetic variability, which modern humans seem to have. We have some modern human genomes from the time period between 45,000 and, and 35,000 years ago. And most of these have much larger genetic variability than the uh, than the Neanderthals, and and I think the reason is likely that that there's just been some kind of maybe cultural mechanisms of groups meeting up from time to time and and exchanging individuals, which with these Neanderthals didn't happen. And and uh, uh, my colleague Fabrizio Maffesoni, for example, did some simulations and proposed that that um, the group that the, that the Chigirska individuals came from. Um, likely uh, consisted of, you know, 20, 30 individuals and received outside gene flow maybe every 10 to 15 generations, which is just, that's just not enough. Um, and, and this long term was, was likely a problem. Um, so I said how before, uh, I, I mean, I said before how there has been this gene flow between Neanderthals and Denisovans and modern humans. Um, and so one of the questions that that you know people also asked and and that I asked myself too when uh, when we found this out was does this you know one to three percent of uh, Neanderthal DNA in us does it actually make a difference is it is it relevant in any way and uh, it seems that it it actually does um, so there's there's been a lot of studies and you know I've I've not been involved personally with any of these but uh, they're absolutely fascinating looking at for example the effects of Neanderthal introgression and Denisovan introgression so gene flow from Neanderthals and Denisovans into modern humans on the immune system and and uh, Abir Rashad and colleagues for example could show that there are variants in our HLA system in the human leukocyte antigen system which are immune receptors on cells um, there are variants that uh, where uh, there are variants coming from Neanderthals and from Denisovans that occur at relatively high frequencies in some pre some uh, populations today and this likely means that um, Neanderthals and Denisovans adapted to some pathogens that were frequent in the local environment and when modern humans uh, interbred with them they picked up these variants and and these variants have been again selected for um, because they were they were advantageous in these in these environments so you have these immune uh, variants but even more interesting is um, an adaptation that comes from Denisovans um, there's a variant of the EPAS1 gene which is a gene linked to um, high altitude adaptation it's present this certain variant today is only present in in tibetans um and we know that uh tibetan women carrying um this this variant have uh kids or babies with a larger birth weight and you know large birth weight of course is a is a big advantage because it makes them also much more likely to survive um tibetans today carry only about 0.1 percent of denisovan dna like every uh everyone else in in east asia but actually, if you look at uh, this one variant, 80% um, of Tibetans carry, carry this specific variant. And interestingly, this variant is almost identical to the one that we find in the, in the Denisovan genome. And so likely, again, this variant came into Tibetans uh, through introgression and then was selected for um, with very strongly. Um, now you ask yourself, you know, why are Denisovans adapted to high altitudes? You know, why do they carry this variant that is adapted to high altitudes? You know, it could have been uh, purely accidental, and we'll see in a moment that maybe maybe it wasn't. Um, uh, Denisova cave itself is not at high altitude; it's at 752 meters above sea level, so you know, um, it's not. Uh, there's definitely no problems with low oxygen uh, there. Um, so, you know, modern humans picked up some variants from, uh, from uh, Denisovans and Neanderthals, um, but there was also gene flow between Neanderthals and Denisovans themselves. We saw evidence uh, for this in the Denisovan genome where there were little pieces that were more Neanderthal-like than you would actually expect. And to our absolute surprise, a few years ago, we found a fragment in Denisova cave that um, gave us very clear evidence about these Neanderthal-Denisovan contacts. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, roughly at the same time in Chigirska cave, you had Neanderthals, in Denisova cave, you had Denisovans. Um, and so, you know, we always asked ourselves, did these guys meet somewhere? And this little fragment here, Denisova 11, also known as Denny, 
um, is a piece that was identified using uh, zooms, QR codes using mass spectroscopy, a collagen fingerprinting method that allows you to identify very small fragments of bone and assign them to a species. So you take a tiny little sample, um, you then uh, digest the collagen that's in there with, with a certain enzyme, and then you look at the length distribution of the fragments of the, uh, of the collagen. Um, and these, uh, these length distributions are specific to, uh, to taxa. And so using this method, which is much faster and cheaper than actually doing DNA, um, there's tens of thousands of tiny bone fragments from Denisova cave. As I said, you know, hyenas were very active there. And you can also see it on this one here. The, in the center, you have a view from the outer surface of the bone. It's relatively strongly etched by some kind of chemical. And actually, in the microstructure, you see this too. The haversian canals are really dilated. And so we think that this is due to digestion by, um, by a carnivore, most likely a, a hyena. Um, this is a tiny bone fragment. We knew from the zooms that it's a hominin. But of course, um, telling, you know, which bone it is, is practically impossible. I, I wasted weeks on trying to figure this out. And, it, you know, it's a long bone. Based on the size, we think that it's, it's likely at least a teenager or older um, because the, 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 the uh, thickness of the cortical bone is at least eight millimeters, which uh, you don't find in, in little kids. But, you know, um, could be a femur, could be a tibia, could be a humerus, who knows. Um, but of course, you know, again, we can use DNA to uh, look at this thing in a bit more detail. And what was fascinating is that even though the mitochondrial DNA we got out of this individual was Neanderthal-like, the nuclear DNA in part was Neanderthal-like, in part was Deni and in, uh, in part it was Denisovan-like. Um, and, we, you know, again, uh, the geneticists ran various simulations and could show that the pattern we see in this individual is exactly what you would expect in a so-called F1 hybrid. So an individual that had a Neanderthal mother, and we knew the mother was a Neanderthal based on the mitochondrial DNA, and a Denisovan father. Um, and you can look at it even in a bit more detail. You can actually look on the chromosomes, and we could see that, that really everywhere in the genome, we usually had both Neanderthal and Denisovan variants, even though fascinatingly, there are also a few parts of the genome where both mother and father were Neanderthal-like. And so we think this actually indicates that these contacts between Neanderthals and Denisovans were not just this one time, not just the parents of this, of this individual, not just Danny's parents who met in the forest maybe somewhere uh, for a romantic uh, dinner and a bit more. Um, but this is also something that the ancestors of Dennis, of Dennis' father already did uh, as well. And based on the length of these fragments, we could estimate that the first uh, Neanderthal Denisovan gene flow happened about uh, 20,000 years before the life of this individual. Um, what is also fascinating is we could actually show that the that the mother of Denny was actually linked to the population that we have from Chigirskaya cave. So uh, she was not one of the of the Neanderthals that lived in Denisova cave um, a long time before. She didn't come from that lineage. She came from the Chigirskaya lineage, which makes sense also based on the uh, on the dating, of course. So again, we get this relatively complex picture of lots of different populations that run around the landscape. And sometimes they meet, and when they meet, they, uh, they happily interbreed. But most of the time, they, you know, they don't seem to interact much, because otherwise they, of course, wouldn't be uh, differentiated genetically. And this likely is linked to, uh, to climatic uh, events as well. But we just don't have sufficient resolution, and, and especially not enough, I mean, sufficient resolution both temporally and spatially to really figure this out. Um, we need to find more sites, of course, with uh, both the Nisovans and Neanderthals. Um, so we know Denisovans from Denisova cave, um, but that can't be the only place they lived. As I told you, you know, we have evidence for gene flow from Denisovans into modern humans uh, in Southeast Asia and in East Asia. And so, you know, they must have been somewhere else as well. And so the last years, our quest has been really to figure out who these, who these Denisovans really were. And one of the most uh, fascinating discoveries uh, comes from a... a uh, the Xiahe region in, in Tibet, in, in what is China today, where in uh, the so-called Baishia Karst Cave, um, which is really, this is on the Tibetan Plateau, this is well over 3,000 meters in altitude, 
Um, in this cave, a Buddhist monk found a jaw in the 1980s and and uh, took this to the monastery. And over over time, it ended up at at Lanzhou University. And uh, a few years ago, was it was analyzed by uh, Frido Velker and Jean Jacques Hublin and and uh, and colleagues. Um, yeah, this is the this is the cave here. And so, what is fascinating is that this mandible morphologically is not what we really see in Neanderthals. It's not really what we see in Homo erectus. It seems to be something different. Again, we luckily we have two teeth and we can't compare these teeth to the teeth from Denisova cave because sadly, all the teeth we have from Denisova are upper teeth, upper molars. We have two upper molars. Here we have two lower molars. Um, but in some ways, they showed some similarities to Denisova. They were also very large um with with complex occlusal uh with complex uh, occlusal patterns and really massive roots and so um based on the morphology and and analyses of ancient proteins sadly there's no dna in this specimen um but there are some proteins in the in the enamel and based on those proteins um uh, Ublin and colleagues have proposed that this is actually a, a denisovan as well and more recently, they published uh, sediment DNA from the from the sediments in this cave that actually fits very closely with the with the DNA sequences we have from Denisova cave. So it seems that uh, that we actually have here from the Tibetan plateau another um, uh, Denisovan. Um, and what is nice with this, we can actually look at this mandible and its morphology and try to link it link it up with other specimens from across Asia. And interestingly, there is a mandible that looks very similar from the uh, uh, Panghu Strait, so the Strait of Taiwan between Taiwan and China, um, that was fished out by uh, by fishermen uh, about ten years ago. That looks very similar to this, and could could also be a, a Denisovan, even expanding their geographic range further. Um, yeah, so this is a uh, this is of course a, 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 a beautiful mandible. Um, more recently, um, just earlier this year, um, there was also a very spectacular find published from, uh, from China, from the, the, uh, town of Harbin, which is in, in, uh, in Manchuria. So in North, uh, in Northeast China, um, which is interesting because it's a region from which otherwise we don't have much, uh, evidence for, for hominin evolution because it's quite cold and dry, again, in some ways uh, similar to Siberia. So in the 1930s, during uh, uh, bridge building work, um, uh, local Chinese workers uh, found this cranium, which they then hid in a, in a well for, uh, for whatever, 80 years, and then brought it out uh, a couple of years ago. And then uh, it's been studied. It's, a, it's an absolutely beautiful cranium um, that was published as a new species, Homo longi, which you know, many of us were not very happy with uh, giving this a species name. I don't think it was necessary. Um, but I, I'm relatively convinced that we actually finally have a face for the for the Denisovans. Um, sadly, this specimen only preserves one molar, but the one molar that is there does look similar to what we have um, from Denisova. And we actually also have a couple of parietal fragments from Denisova cave that we're still working on analyzing in detail um, that also fit with the morphology we see here. This is clearly not a Neanderthal. It's clearly not a modern human. Um, but it shows some similarities to some uh, like early ancestors of Neanderthals, which is exactly what you'd kind of expect. And again, this is an absolutely enormous uh, cranium, um, much larger than 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 anything else we know from from uh, hominin evolution, which you know to me indicates that the Nisvans likely were were in general relatively uh, lar large boned. Um, the phylogenetic analyses of this specimen are again problematic um based on the morphology um they they associated it with the shiahe mandible which i'm you know i think is a little hard because these two specimens don't share anything uh, any morphology in common um but i think the idea that it that it is comparable to some of the material from china such as dali uh, and uh, jinyu shan which are again specimens that were usually referred to as as uh, chinese uh, archaic homo sapiens or Asian middle Pleistocene, um, that kind of makes sense. Um, the problem here is that be, in in these analyses, Ni et al. proposed that this is actually the sister group of uh, of 
modern humans, so cl closer related to us than Neanderthals are. And that is, um, at least if we accept that this specimen is a Denisovan, this doesn't fit with the genetic data at all. And so I, I maybe I'm biased, but I, I do think that the, that the genetic data is probably more reliable than, than this for uh, reconstructing our phylogeny. Anyway, um, it slowly seems that we are getting a bit of a better understanding of who these who these Denisovans are. Um, there are some rumors that there is some Denisovan material from Southeast Asia as well that will be published soon. Um, you know, um, I think it's going to be uh, quite exciting over over the over the next years. Um, and I I feel very you know very privileged that I had the chance of of be, you know playing a little part in in uh, in figuring out how our how our ancestors uh, uh, interacted uh, in this in this really fascinating region. Um, I'd like to thank you know many many people as as Laura mentioned you know I I, I don't work alone I I work in in large groups I think that uh, working with people from with lots of different specialties can be extremely enriching because it allows you a much uh, it, it gives you both a much more nuanced view of the past, but also allows you to to answer some uh, larger questions that you that you couldn't do otherwise. Um, and again, thank you for the invitation, and I'd be happy to answer any any questions you have. <laughs>